intertwined patterns of integers and patterns of thought processes. So without any further ado, please. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor and a little intimidating to be uh, among so many highly accomplished mathematicians because I dropped out of math graduate school uh, and uh, I have been deeply fascinated by mathematics ever since I was a kid, but, uh, but I found the, the challenges of math graduate school a little bit too, too difficult. So it's an honor and almost a bafflement to me as to why I would be the keynote speaker, except I will say that sequences of, of, of whole numbers have been an incredibly central part of my life in different phases of my life and in different fashions, uh, and um, so I will uh, just explain that. It's sort of a, a, an autobiographical talk, which is a, a, a little random walk among certain types of sequences. I must say, I'm a little too old to have been formed by the uh, handbook or encyclopedia or online encyclopedia of integer sequences because uh, I did most of my explorations of sequences before the, the book appeared. Uh, and, uh, but nonetheless, I am a, a occasional minor contributor to the book through some of the sequences that I've explored. And I, there have been so many, so many, I mean, I, I, in preparing this talk, I went through uh, large files of things that I'd explored and saw that they were just gobs of them. Uh, many of them I couldn't figure out from my scribblings what on earth I was doing, but uh, that's, uh, that's the way it was. I didn't document them as well as I would have liked, but I certainly know some of them extremely intimately. So, um, what I will say is that as a, uh, my, one of the things I will conclude with is talking about uh, how my passion for sequences, which started when I was around 15 or 16, uh, that number seems to appear in the live stories of many people here when I was a 15-year-old, when I was a 16-year-old. Same for me. Um, uh, so it was the passion lasted for quite a number of years, and then it sort of went dormant, but it, it came back when I was a graduate student in, in physics, uh, and it, it was that passion that had, that gave me the, uh, that made me be the right person at the right place at the right time, and I made a, a lovely discovery, which I will uh, show you here. I can figure out how to make this thing work. I think I can. Yes, okay. This was uh, uh, something that I'll talk about just very, very briefly uh, when I come to it again later on because it's out of chronological order, but it's a, it's a rather spectacular looking graph, uh, sort of a multifractal as it is called, and uh, I called it G-plot when I found it, and that's what I always still call it, but many people call it the Hofstadter butterfly, so that's nice. Um, and it's closely related to things that I did when I was exploring integer sequences. So now I'm going to begin that, that story. So uh, we begin with something that everyone knows, the triangular numbers, which uh, of course are in the handbook. Uh, and uh, I had a friend, uh, actually John Mather of the Princeton Math Department at the time, he was just a couple of years older than me, he was starting Harvard. And, uh, he and I exchanged some letters and uh, we were talking about triangular numbers, and I got very interested in them. And for some reason that I don't remember, I decided to interleave them with the squares. And so there they are on the lower level. The, the red ones and the squares are the blue ones above. Actually, I, I, I wonder if the sequence of interleaved triangles and squares is a sequence. In, in I doubt that it would be, but it, uh, it's a possibility. To me, it's, it's something very familiar, although it is a two-level sequence, so in a sense, it's really not one sequence. In any case, I was counting the number of reds between blues and allowing, uh, when they coincided, I would draw a line on this side. I guess I could use this thing. So anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, just, just to tell you, yes. uh, uh, is this in the OIS? Uh, it is. Uh, with a reference to one of your 
Oh, okay. I'm curious. All right. So, uh, so there you see what happens when there are uh, when you count triangular numbers between squares. You get the sequence at the bottom: two, one, two, one, one, two. And you should memorize that um, because it will come back later. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll show you. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, there it is again. Uh, and I've just highlighted the two one ones that that are there. And you know, as a kid, I explored this just empirically. I, I did it by hand at first. I got about I don't know how many terms, uh, probably a hundred terms by hand, and then. I, I used a mechanical calculator, and then I used a computer later. But I didn't really need to use the computer. I mean, by the time I had done it by hand, I could see what was going on. It took me a couple of days, and I, uh, I was extremely excited when I realized that uh, if you counted the number of 21s between the two 11s, you got back the same sequence. In other words, I guess I can try this thing out now. I hope I understand it. There, there's one. There are two of them there. One of them there. Two of them there. One of them there. One of them there. And two of them there. Can you see what I'm finding? Does that work for you? Okay. So two, one, two, one, one, two, and there. That is the sequence itself. And that was a fabulously exciting discovery for me, as a uh, 15, 16 year old. Uh, and of course, I wanted to experience it again. So. I did, uh, you know, I'm talking about analogies, so I, uh, many of my analogies were uh, a kind of a natural thing to do, which is to uh, spot a, um, a knob and then twist the knob to other settings. And so triangle is a knob which says three, and square is a knob that says four. And so I just thought, well, let's uh, set the knob at five. And, uh, and see what happens. Either count triangles between pentagonal numbers or count squares between pentagonal numbers and so forth and so on with higher level polygon numbers. And you can generalize this algebraically also, and I did it both ways. I mean, I saw that they were equivalent. And um, I didn't, I mean, I found sequences that were, that had some similar properties, but they didn't give themselves back as this one had done by counting something between something. And so I was a little disappointed. So, in, you know, I, I, I was doing many things in parallel, one of the, more or less in parallel. One of them that I next tried was I found another knob on the original problem, that is, uh, the triangular numbers were the sums of numbers up to n. Well, I just said, well, let's look at products instead. And uh, Michael Somos already uh, talked about the uh, double factorials. I wasn't aware that that was the name of them, but you know the products of odd numbers, and that was that's the what you do if you replace the time the plus signs with times in the definite in the squares. One instead of one plus three plus five, it's one times three times five. So that was the analog of the squares. And then I counted uh, I counted uh, factorials in between odd number products, and here you see something. Uh, no, it's not working. Is it? It likes my right hand. It doesn't like my left hand. Okay, 2, 1, 1, 2, and so forth. I, I'm not going to go into this one because, again, although it had some curious properties, it, I didn't find anything fascinating about it. I'm just sort of showing you, carrying you along with me as I, as I make a sort of a meandering walk in, and trying to find interesting things. So um, the next thing I thought of was going sort of one level of generality above polygonal numbers. I just thought, well, why not just polynomials? Just count one type of one polynomial in one variable between uh, another polynomial in, a, in, in one variable. And um, I thought about that, didn't explore it too much, but it led me to the, uh, the, the next level up in abstraction, which would be uh, count one values of one function of one variable between the values of another function. And uh, so I thought, well, what's some simple functions and powers of two and powers of three? And so that was my next uh, exploration where we had the same kind of thing and then we see a sequence. Uh, uh, 2, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 2, and it, it looked kind of interesting. Um, and uh, I just go through a little bit of uh, calculation here to say that the, uh, the kth term, and it does, really does not like my, oh, there it is. Okay. 
trained it. Okay, so the, the, it, where if, if alpha is log to the base two of three, this is the formula for the uh, the kth term of this sequence, where this the brackets indicate the floor. So uh, I uh, I'm not going to uh, show this sequence. I'm going to because it, it has. Um, it's confusing if you if you if you look at. I'm going to take a similar sequence of uh, counting powers of four between powers of five, and you may not be able to tell that uh, these are ones and twos, and I made the twos a little bit bigger. So now, if you count them, you get uh, there are five of them here, five of them, five of them, and six of them, and five, 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 and so forth. So you get another sequence that looks kind of similar, except that it's made of fives and sixes. And now if you count the fives between sixes, you get four, four, three, four, four, three, and so forth. And in that sequence, if you count fours between threes, you get two and something else. So it seems as if what you get each time by counting thing, the, the thing whose density changes uh, between the... Uh, well, let me just give you some terminology. The thing that occurs individually I call a sep. The six here is a sep, and the the fives are counts, because I'm counting them. So you count counts between sets for separators. Uh, if you count the counts between sets, you get you, these things I call the eta sequences. So you get another eta sequence, uh, and, uh, and it keeps on going. Now, uh, before I uh, explain any more about eta sequences, I wanted to just, again, talk about analogy making a little bit. Uh, if I go back to this formula here, I've actually written it in a way that maybe I wrote it this way, but maybe not. I think I didn't have the alpha there. I think I put log 2 right there and right there. So to me, there was no alpha there. There was just log to the base 2 of 3. And I remember I was in the office of uh, my friend and mentor, Gordon Latta, who was on the faculty at Stanford. And I was showing him these things, and I was saying I was generalizing, making a generalization of this kind of thing by, you know, varying the two and the three. Those are the knobs I saw. I saw two integer knobs. And Gordon Lattice said, what are you talking about? Your variable here is, is alpha. It's a real number. That's what you should be. And of course, the, you know, log to the base n of m is a dense subset of the real line in any case, and I would have realized that perhaps sooner or later that you know I can get as close as I want to any any number, so I might as well just let alpha run over the real numbers. Uh, and, and so I did. And that's uh, that was the beginning of uh, a, a lot of exploration, a great deal of which I can only uh, touch you know, the surface. But that was my definition. The kth term of the eta sequence of alpha is k plus 1 alpha minus k alpha with the greatest integer function attached to both of those. And it, as I said, it's composed always of two integers, the cown, which is, by coincidence, has the letter C for closest, and the sep, which by coincidence has the letter S for second closest, so we have cown and sep. You can think of C as standing for closest, and S as second closest, or C as cown and S as sep. In any case, so if you take uh, the eta sequence of the square root of two, it consists of ones and twos, one being more frequent because it's the more it's the closer integer. Uh, for the golden ratio, it's the other way around. Uh, for pi, it's composed of threes and fours, with three being more frequent. For e, it's composed of threes and twos, with also three being more frequent. And uh, and so the fundamental theorem was, well, first of all, I guess I'm showing the, the derivative process, which is you take you count the number of counts between successive steps, and yes, it's a different eta sequence, and this is the fundamental theorem that if you take that derivative, as I called it, the derivative sequence is also an eta sequence with a different alpha, uh, which is sep minus alpha over alpha minus count. Um, and, and that is the, rate, the, the, the distance to the second closest integer divided by the distance to the first closest integer. And that's always greater than equal to 1. And I'm always, always thinking about alpha as being a, an irrational number so that you could take the derivative an infinite number of times. If it was rational, the process would terminate at some point in an integer. But those integers interested me less, so I'm just going to concentrate on the, uh, the case of, uh, of irrational. So uh, this was a sort of a vertical structure that you got that was associated with uh, any alpha that you began with, the count and the set, and then you would take its uh, derivative, alpha prime, 
uh, and then take its concept and then take that number's derivative and take its concept and so forth. Now, of course, I was uh, very curious to explore this. Here's a, an example, just the square root of two, since uh, it turns out that the sequence is its own derivative instantly. And, um, and so, uh, since it is, the counts are always one, and the seps are always two every, on all levels. Um, and, uh, and incidentally, this, uh, you can make a, s a sequence of counts and seps, uh, any arbitrary s vertical sequence of counts and seps that you want, as long as they differ by uh, one. They always have to differ by one, and they always have to the, the lower of the two has to be at least one. Um, and so this was a um, this was a, a, a nice fact. I could write down any sequence of counts and steps I wanted as long as they obeyed those little constraints and, and they would determine a real number for me. Uh, this second example uh, is for the golden ratio and it is uh, the reverse. It, uh, the, the two numbers, the square root of two and, and phi, are in some sense complementary to each other. Needless to say, I wanted to explore other numbers. Uh, I immediately tried E. Um, and um, I, I was working at this time, this about 1961, with uh, a Burroughs uh, computer at Stanford. It was the only computer that Stanford had. And uh, it, it had about 10 or 12 decimal digits of precision. And I was able to calculate the count and the sep sequence as far as it shows here. And uh, on the left side, I wasn't, you know, I mean, I could see some kind of pattern where, where the ones seem to be sort of starting to go every other term. And on the right side, where the twos seem to be going every other term. But I was particularly struck by the right side because I saw that if you eliminated the every other term twos, you had two, three, five, seven. And that was a s sequence that maybe some of you have heard of before. Two, three, five, seven, and, and I was thinking, oh my God, E contains the prime numbers. Uh, and, and so here, was I, this cartoon I found some years later, but uh, from the New Yorker. And, and this really was the feeling that I had, depending, of course, on how far down it goes. And um, so in order to find, to find it, you know, empirically, I had to uh, do higher precision, but at that time, you know, it was very difficult. I, I got, I finally found a, a, a higher, a triple precision arithmetic routine, which consisted of about 400 cards. I was programming on cards, of course, that I had to put at the back of my program. I mean, my program was probably 20 cards long, but I had to append 400 more cards, and it would read it in and then do it. And so, thanks to that triple precision uh, routine, I could extend it, and here's how it came out. 2, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15. And so, it was still pretty, but not quite as exciting as it had been the prime numbers. Um, I've often wondered, by the way, and I'm sure many of you have, have often wondered, whether, in some sense, the, begin, the exact way that the prime numbers begin matters. That is, it seems sort of, it, it seems as if nature doesn't really care about how the prime numbers really start. What nature cares about is how they're distributed after, you know, sort of asymptotically. It doesn't care that the first one is two or something like that. So that two, three, five, seven was, uh, that, that was sort of uh, my reading too much into into uh, into that the thing, but anyway, it was exciting, and uh, and it gave me uh, the impetus to continue exploring. As I told you earlier, uh, the square root of two and phi were each other's complements. That is, the count of one, the vertical sequence of counts of one, was equal to the vertical sequence of seps of the other. And so uh, I thought this would be an interesting thing to uh, to try to explore. What in general. Since uh, if I knew I could exchange counts and subsequences, and, and there would be a number that would have the exchanged columns, um, so why not uh, see what happens? And uh, I, we didn't have plotters in those days. Everything had to be done by hand. Uh, so I got out numbers and I plotted them. And I'm not going to show you my hand plots, but years later I did. I reconstructed sort of the kind of thing I saw when I first did this. 
And it looked about like this. And I didn't really know how to interpret it. And I wasn't thinking terribly hard. I was more just calculating and, and, uh, and drawing the points. I, I didn't have this many points. I didn't see this much accuracy. But I did see that it sort of consisted of little streaks. You might call them ribs or something like that. Uh, and they got smaller and smaller as you went toward the corners of uh, the uh, this square between 0 and 1. And uh, so I wanted to know what the little streak like that looked like in greater detail. So I had the, the computer calculate it for me and it got something like that. And then all of a sudden I saw basically that this was going to go down and down and down and continue. And so eventually some Years later, when I, we had nice plotting equipment, I was able to make nice plots of it, and this is how it looked. And I was able to prove uh, that, the, how this thing uh, was nested inside itself infinitely many times, and what the exact nature was of the curve that, because it's curved, it's sort of distorted. But it's, it, despite the distortion, it still, in some sense, is the same object, just distorted a little bit. Um, and so that was a very exciting discovery for me. This shows you where the, uh, where the copies are located, which in case it wasn't self-evident. Um, but it shows it on more than one level. You can see it down there too. You can see the squares encasing the, the other copies. And it keeps on going down, down, down. And when you get closer and closer to the corners, this thing gets less and less distorted. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's more straight. I generalized data sequences to uh, two-dimensional structures, made eta lattices, proved a theorem that uh, in some sense there was a kind of a derivative of eta lattice, which was another eta lattice. With, uh, these had two, two real parameters now, uh, and I was able to show that the derivative in a certain sense uh, of, of, the no of the term was uh, another eta lattice. And uh, so that was interesting to me too, but uh, on I went. Uh, shifted data sequences, just cut off the first few terms, like if you cut off the first six terms of the data sequence of the square root of two, you basically are just shifting it by six, so you can move uh, six times the square root of two over to the right side, it's sort of a, a shift by a delta. So I generalized the, uh, the idea of an data sequence to have a shift of delta, where delta was some, any real number, uh, and uh, it didn't matter. Uh, its integer part didn't matter since that was ignored by the floor thing, uh, but it, its fractional part was what counted. And I was able to show that, again, if you create an eta sequence of this form and took its derivative, it would, again, be another eta sequence with an alpha prime and a delta prime. So you had, uh, you, you still, the fundamental theorem still held. Um, and uh, coming for full circle, it was exciting to me that finally when I had defined this thing, I found that the eta sequence of the square root of 2 with a shift of a half was my original triangles between squares sequence. Uh, this was shifting it out, but shifting it out infinitely far because no finite shift will give you a half since the all, multiple, all integer multiples of the square root of 2 are irrational, so you'll never get a half as your... Uh, as your delta. But if you put in a half, you, you get back triangles between squares, and I was able to prove that, and I was very happy. Now, among the other, th I was doing many things, exploring all sorts of sequences, which I don't have the time to go into, but one of the things that I got into was playing a game with some of my friends who were interested in mathematics, which was uh, basically, we called it the function game, and the idea was that you would invent uh, a formula uh, using a certain vocabulary of symbols, and uh, then the, your opponent would have to guess, would have to try to figure out what your formula was, or at least an equivalent formula, by probing the function at certain values or by asking certain kinds of questions uh, that were allowed. There were certain kinds of questions that allowed, and the more questions they took, the lower their score, uh, and the lower, uh, the, the simpler that the, the function looked in terms of the symbols that you used, uh, the better it was for you as the function creator. I mean, obviously you can create a very complicated function with a lot of symbols, but if you use very few symbols to create a very, very mysterious function, that was good. And we played the game many times, explored it. Uh, one of the things we allowed was recursion in our definitions. And so um, 
I invented this on a, on a lark one day. I had no idea what it would give. Uh, but uh, it, it's cost, it, it was fairly cheap because it didn't use many symbols, but it had a very peculiar behavior and, uh, and it, it started me out on another set of explorations. So here's a sort of a value, uh, the, this is the uh, a tree which, uh, which shows sort of how the function, the values of the function are oriented where, for example, again, the f of 14 is 9, f of 9 is 6, f of 6 is 4, and so forth. I don't know if you can read these numbers. If you can't, uh, then I'm sorry. Uh, but if I wanted to calculate, for example, there's uh, 21, if I can read it myself. I'm in a very strange angle, but that's 21, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So if I wanted to calculate f of 22, I need to take f of, or I should say g of g of 21. So I have to start here. That, uh, that, I'm sorry, g of g, of, I've said this wrong. If I want to calculate g of 22, I have to take g of g of 21. So I go down one and go down another, and that gets me to eight. And of course, you can see the Fibonacci numbers along here. Uh, so I get to eight, and I subtract it from 22. And that gives me the value, and that's 14. And so I put it above here. Now, if I want to do it for 23, I do the same thing. I go down from 22, two steps and then subtract it from 23. And that's 14 again, and so 23 goes here. So I get a fork above the 14. Uh, for 24, I would go down twice, get to 9, and subtract it from 24, and I get 15. So 24 goes above here, and so forth. I mean, and um, so I originally made the tree just as a convenience for calculation. In other words, you know, if I want to know g of g of n, I just look two, two levels down. Instead of looking at a table, um, I have a, a display which makes it easier. Uh, but it turned out, of course, that this that the shape was of interest. And uh, so if, if I replace, well, let's see. The, you, the basically, it's a recursively uh, structured shape, which is, uh, you can define it by saying that um, you, you see there are trunks and there are uh, bifurcations. On the left side of every bifurcation is another bifurcation, and on the right side of every bifurcation there's a trunk. So this sort of shows it here, although it, it does it with one level, extra level of recursion indicated to make it a little simpler to understand. Here's the simplest version of all. It just says here's a, here's a bifurcation. On the left you put the tree itself, and on the right you put the tree itself, but after one vertical step. So that's that's the full definition of the structure. Now, I, was, I asked myself questions like, what would be the recursive function if I flipped this and made the mirror image of this tree? What would be, what recursive function would give that? And I was able to find an answer to that. And so the flip tree question was one in general that I was interested in, but in general I was unable to, uh, to answer that question. Uh, it was very difficult. Uh, the fork function is you just replace you just put the multiplicity of the of the node. Uh, you write two whenever it's a branch, and you write one whenever it isn't. Um, and so it, it turns out that the sequence here, one, two, two, one, two, is there. It is. Uh, if you read it, go up each level, go left to right, go left to right each time going like that. That's the eta sequence of. Uh, the golden ratio, with one term missing, there's a two there at the very beginning that's missing. Um, and here's another way of, of seeing that fork, the, the pattern of forking. Um, so these were nice discoveries. I wanted again to experience it, so I saw a knob in the function definition that I had created, which was of course that there was two, and so I made it three. And uh, that, whoops, that gave me this tree, which was very similar. It was, in fact, almost identical, except that now the trunks were of height two, where the previously they had, uh, or it depends on how you count it, height three, you could say height three. Uh, in any case, this is the, uh, I call this the H function, and so this is the, the, the recursive structure of the tree for the H graph. And again, you can ask all sorts of questions about what is the fork function for this tree, what is the, the recursive definition of the flip of this tree, and so forth. And I got very involved in exploring, uh, in general, these kinds of trees. I mean, since I'd already seen one who, whose fork function was an eta sequence of 
the golden ratio, I tried sticking in other numbers as uh, and making their eta sequences be the uh, the fork function for trees, and then seeing what kind of function I got out. The, it was sometimes it was very interesting, but it was a little too complicated. Actually, I found that it was already hard enough if you simply used 